Great. So we're going to start. So everybody, welcome and uh, good morning in North America and good afternoon in Europe and the Middle East and North Africa and uh, good evening, I think, in India almost or late afternoon. So welcome, everybody. I think there's somebody from China as well, so it's evening there. Uh, so today we're going to have two uh, lectures in this session, and we're very honored and uh, fortunate to have two, two leading scholars with us. Uh, we have Joel Kotek and Joe or Jonathan Wolf. Uh, very briefly, Joel is a professor <clears throat> at the Free University in Brussels and at the Institut d'Etudes Politiques de Paris. He's a member of uh, several scientific uh, committees, including the uh, Historical Review for the Shoah in France and Paris, and the Jewish Museum of Warsaw, and the Machlen Holocaust Museum Foundation, uh, as well as the Adeline Project, which uh, brings Muslims, uh, scholars, and intellectuals to know more about the, the history of the Holocaust. Um, he's written widely. He's been affiliated with ISGAP for uh, many years. He was on the first program as a scholar in residence and has been teaching with us ever since. And I'm also uh, happy and honored to welcome Joe Wolf. Uh, Jonathan Wolf is the Alfred Landecker Professor of Values and Public Policy and at, at the Blavadnik School of Government uh, and uh, Public Policy in Oxford. Um, he, he's a professor of public policy, and he, before joining Oxford, he was a professor of philosophy and the, deans of, the dean of arts and science at UCL. He's currently developing a new research program on revitalizing notions of democracy and civil society in accordance with the aims of the Alfred Landecker professorship here at Oxford. He's currently working on a uh, work largely concerns notions, it deals with notions of equality disadvantage, social justice, and poverty, as well as the applied uh, topics such as public safety, disability, gambling, and, and the regulation of recreational drugs, which has been discussed in his book, Ethics and Public Policy, a Philosophical Inquiry, which was published by Rutledge. And he's a leading scholar with many publications. You can see his full biography in the handbook. Um, so to start, I think we'll start with um, Joel Kotek, which will give more of a historical background to issues of anti-Semitism. Joel will, will speak first on the myth of Judas as the origin of modern anti-Semitism. And after Joel is finished, we'll take a few questions of, uh, I guess, points of clarification, and then we'll listen to, to Joe. And Joe will be looking at the topic of his lecture will be, is entitled, The Lure of Fascism. So Joel, please take the floor, and we're honored that you're both here with us. Thank you. Before, before Joel begins, let me just, uh, I see many of you, uh, I know with the limitations of Zoom and the pandemic, having us in our homes, it can be tough, but uh, I would encourage you all to turn your cameras on and show your faces. You know, this, we're trying to make this as intimate of a summer institute as possible, despite the limitations. So, uh, you know, having your cameras on, being able to see your faces uh, can go a long way. So, uh, you know, barring whatever mess you have in your room, please, uh, you know, feel free to show your face. Thanks, Ira. Joel, thanks for being here. The floor is yours. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to... Give me a second. Okay. Joel, you're trying to share the screen. Uh, <laughs> I think the Wi-Fi connection is a bit weak. Normally, it's open. He has it. Okay. Ah. 
This is life in the age of the pandemic. <laughs> yes. It's okay. Take your time. Do you see something? Do you see the presentation? No, we just see you. Oh. Do you want? Do you want to take time to set it up, and we can start with Joe? No, 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 no. Okay. We will. It's, it's going to work. Okay. Hopefully. Ah, there he is. Okay. <laughs> there we go. And, uh, here we are. Okay. The presentation. Hello. There we go. So, wait. Yes. Good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Okay, it's okay. okay. Merci, Armando. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay, but I'm not in Belgium. I'm in, in Italy right now, in the mountain. Uh, so I will try my presentation. I know I've got only 30 minutes. So what I will try to say, I will try to explain what anti-Semitism actually is and the origin and the importance of uh, making a differentiation between what I call anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism and to demonstrate that even if the word anti-Semitism was invented in the 19th century, anti-Semitism is back from the Middle Age. And that's on one fundamental myth, and the myth of Judah, which is considered the matrix of... What is the important... What we think anti-Semitism doesn't tell us no. about Jews, of course, but about societies. The crisis yep. are in profound change. Joel, can Joel. understand, thanks to the definition, of course, that, yeah? Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. The connection is yeah. not good. Actually, you keep cutting out. Huh. Uh, you want to try and start again? Because it's bad. So, what do I have to say? Yeah, the connection is not good. Ira, do you have any ideas? The, your bandwidth is low, Joel. So, I, mean, I what? I think the, just keeping the, the camera yeah. off might help. Uh, so, and you had turned it off for a second there. You will. You can cut it, Ira. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah, good. Go ahead. Try now. Okay. Sorry again. That's much better. Good. Okay. Thanks. So, what is anti Semitism? And I will try to demonstrate it. It's a social disease, a collective psychosis. And my definition of anti Semitism is Jews are responsible for the roots of the means, Jews are responsible for the misfortune of the world. And this idea, and this is an example, uh, uh, dating back from time, the famous sentence, die sind unser Unglück, will believe, start back to the Middle Age. This is a good uh, uh, demonstrate actually the function. It's a postcard made by a Russian artist just before the Cold War, and it stressed the fact that of course, useful to Jews as the usual suspect. You will see France, you will see Germany, you will see Austria, etc., England and Russia, pointing the hand to the Jews for being responsible of uh, uh, during the first idea that the Jews are the misfortune of the world. It's an old idea. It is born at the end of the 11th century and not in the 19th century. When the word actually anti Semitism was invented, actually, as you know, by an anti Semite. It was indeed in the Middle Age that the old Christian anti Judaism was transformed into anti Semitism, that the mutation actually came. So, what seems to be important as an historian is that one shouldn't confuse between anti Judaism and anti Semitism. What is anti Judaism? Anti Judaism, of course, is the creation. Uh, the two religion which actually derive from Judaism, it means Christianity and, and, and Islam, 
and its hostility limited to the Abrahamic religion. Of course, you won't find real anti-Semitism in civilization which has nothing to do with Judaism. So anti-Judaism should be considered the precise of the installation on both sides of the Mediterranean of Christianity and Islam, two religions directly born from Judaism, and of course they will be rival, and it's a competitive phase, and as I said, the map no. you know, Christianity, Joel, so Joel, yeah? I'm sorry, the, yeah. connection, the connection's not very good. I'm wondering, are you able to call Ira using WhatsApp, and maybe Ira can put the phone next to the speaker. Is that, will that help at all? If you, I don't know what to tell you. Ira, do you have any ideas? Let me see if I can, excuse me. Maybe it's a question of the mic. Maybe. We can. And we can have Joel can, dial in, oh and I can do slides, but uh, I need to see what we're doing. If not, you can, you can phone me on WhatsApp. Yeah, I think that would be the best, and Ira could put the, uh, your speaker next, next to the phone, the phone oh. next to the speaker. Okay. Sorry about this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so sorry. Ira, you have your contact information. Sorry, everybody. Now, I will have maybe... Uh, Okay. I like that. So I will have my. Ça marche? Is it better like yeah. this? Much better. Welcome. Okay, I have a mic. Yes? Okay. Is it? It's much better. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Désolé. Huh? That was perfect. So, as I said, you understand anti Judaism as, of course, but as a neurosis, what I call the cognitive, why the position of both Christianity and Islam, the Quran, of course, are essentially based on biblical stories. And of course, those who refuse to disappear, the Jews, of course, controlled the original and holy myth. So what is, Anti Judaism is a position of the father, will inspire, of course, the relation between Judaism and the two religions, Islamic Christianity. And of course, Christianity and Islam will logically use their mother religion. And to summarize this, made by Daniel Siboni, he said the origin of the origin. And this is the core anti Semitism. So anti-Judaism, it's the rational opposition. Joel, that's me. Hello? Hello, Joel. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, maybe Does if it I work? Hold it. Does it work? Yeah, close your microphone and let's see. Let's use it. Okay. Hold, hold. okay. I, cl I close the microphone. Perfect, okay. Go ahead. I don't know how to do this. I think I can do it, no? Go ahead. Okay, so. No, no. <laughs> this face, the Jews are blamed for what they are. People opposing here the sanctity of Christ, there of Mohammed. And of course, they despise the Jews for what they are, it means. They pray on Shabbos in a synagogue and not on Friday in a mosque or Sunday in a church. No. Joel, no, it's cutting out. I think I think we're gonna stop, Ira, unless uh, you have another idea. And maybe Joe, uh, you can speak now. Is that okay? Yeah, we can. And Ira, maybe you can try and fix uh, Joel's connection. I don't know. Joel, we're gonna. I think we're gonna stop you so now. It's very complex. Yeah, it's not working, even on my phone. So. Okay, I'm sorry, everybody, for this. So, so Joe Wolf, um, if you can please give your presentation now, and we'll try and um, I don't know help to organize Joel Kotek a bit. Sorry, everybody, and Joe, sorry for putting you on the spot. So, welcome. <laughs> uh, 
I, that's no problem. I just want to get my notes up on the screen. Okay, take correctly. your time. Uh, see if I can do that. Um, ah. So take your time. In the meantime, Ira, you'll yep. try and reach out to Joe and try and sort it out if you can. Can you okay, just uh, um, send me his number, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll WhatsApp you his phone number. Because even, even now, like on my phone with WhatsApp, it wasn't connecting. Right, yeah. It's all internet-based. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm going to WhatsApp you his number. Okay, so I'm ready when you're ready for me. Okay, yeah, please go ahead, Joe. Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay, it's absolutely my pleasure. So thank you, Charles, for inviting me and uh, making me part of the summer school, which is very impressive. Um, so I'm also not in my hometown. You can see behind me uh, the Blavatnik School of Government where I work uh, in Oxford. I, I live in London. In fact, I'm in Jersey in the Channel Islands at the moment, and I'm using a internet link I haven't been able to test out but I think it's working so Charles you just nodded that yeah. that's a good sign yeah, yeah. we hear you well it, it, it sounds okay great okay so um I just give a little bit of background before I get going you'll see from the two logos behind me um there's the Blavatnik School of Government and also the uh, Alfred Landica Foundation so I was uh working at the Blavatnik School but my chair was relaunched as the Alfred Landaker Professor of Values and Public Policy. And uh, Alfred Landaker uh, was a, a German man who died uh, at the hands of the Nazis in the Holocaust. And the chair was named in his honor um, by his descendants who only recently discovered that they were his descendants, a very wealthy German family who had no idea of the sort of tangled family history they had until it was fairly recently uncovered by a historian. And um, it was a very poignant thing for me to be asked if I would be in, interested in the chair because my own family uh, also is related, my family history is related to the Holocaust. So my father and his sister came to the UK my father was eight years old and his sister 11 years old on the kinder transport from Frankfurt and their parents never managed to get out of Germany so they, they were murdered by the Nazis and you know, many of the remaining members of the family um, did manage to get out scattered around the world to America and others to the UK but also many didn't but uh, Reflecting on this as a child, um, you know, I was told my father came over on the kinder transport. It didn't mean a lot to me. You know, people say a lot about their family history. It was just, it seemed like a perfectly normal thing to happen. Um, and I didn't really think very much of it. And I didn't know how his parents died. My mother told me uh, a story about the house being bombed and the house being bombed in the war which I believed until I was about 21, believe it or not. And then I uh, found from my father, he, he was giving a retirement speech and mentioned his parents being killed in the Holocaust. And it hadn't occurred to me that um, a Jewish family in Germany had died that way. So it was just not an object of curiosity. But probably in the last 10 years, in, with so much anti-refugee feeling around the world, it's been you know, more important for me to identify it as being from a refugee family. And um, a little while ago, 2016, um, I was asked to write a blog for Oxford University Press about immigration. And so I began it by saying that, like a lot of people of Jewish ancestry of my age, I'm descended from three generations of asylum seekers. So that my father was an asylum from Nazi Germany, on my mother's side, her mother uh, as a baby from Ukraine, and her father was born in England in um, Brick Lane in the East End of London. But his family were from Russianized Poland. So we have, and they were all asylum seekers. But of course, they never use that terminology. And, um, it, but it seems to me very important to express solidarity. So I've been, been identifying as being from a refugee family. It, it feels very strange 
uh, not using that terminology until I was probably in my 50s. Um, but now it, it does seem important. And lots of other people are saying very similar things in the UK, not that it's making a lot of difference. So I was pleased to take on the chair, but um, it was in an area that I hadn't worked on before. That, as Charles said, my work before had been about equality, disadvantage, disability, a lot of issues around social policy and public policy, but I'd never looked very hard at fascism or democracy. So I took on a new research project really with this chair, which is quite an unusual thing to do because you know, normally you have the research and you get the grant. This time around, I sort of got the grant and then had to do the research and, and change areas. So I, I read as much as I could, as quickly as I could. And um, I got very interested in the parallels between Nazi Germany and what we're seeing now and reading contemporary scholars, some of which said that we can very clearly see the parallels and other scholars saying this was historical and that there are no real comparisons and maybe some other point of history, maybe 1880 rather than 1930 is a better point of companion comparison. Everyone's got their favorite decade. But anyway, um, I thought I should look harder at the rise of the Nazis and the rise of fascism in Europe and see what we could see. I was very fortunate that a friend of mine called Edmund Fawcett has just published a book called Conservatism. Or I'm not sure if it's actually hit the book stands yet, but I've seen it in proof with Princeton University Press. And he's a sort of historian of ideas, uh, but also political hist historian. And I asked him what I should read about the rise of the Nazis. And he recommended two books, which I've recommended to you. One is quite well known, Robert Paxton's anatomy of fascism but the other i'm not sure how well known it is and it was published as a penguin book so many of you will know that um, the uk publisher penguin was a pioneer for us anyway in the uk of publishing very cheap paperback books and in 1938 they knew the world was in crisis or there was a crisis looming and they had an imprint of books which they published very rapidly so they would go, instead of having the long drawn out process we're all used to now, they would take a manuscript and try to get it in the bookshops within a few months if they could. And there's an author called E.O. Lorimer who wrote one of these books called um, What Hitler Wants. Uh, when I lecture on this normally, I wave a copy in front. It's a Penguin Books Orange. There's a sort of cartoon of Hitler on the front and it's called What Hitler Wants. And um, you have no clue at all about who E.O. Lorimer is. It doesn't say anything about the author. But E.O. Lorimer was a woman called Emily Lorimer, who was the wife of an army officer, uh, but also taught German at Somerville College in Oxford, which is actually next door to the Blavatnik School. Um, I'm not sure what capacity she had. She may have been just a type of adjunct teacher there. But she made a discovery. Um, which she thought was very important. And she had read the English translation of Mein Kampf, which seemed like um, you know, a fairly reasonable political program, perhaps a, maybe not to everyone's taste in the UK, but um, nothing particularly out of the ordinary. And she then read the German, trans, the German original, which, had been, which at that time was being given to everyone on their wedding, so uh, Mein Kampf was a wedding present from the Nazi party to everyone getting married. So there were more than half a million copies of Mein Kampf in circulation in Germany at that time. And she realized that the English translation was a type of bowdlerized with you know, heavily abridged with many of the most unpleasant and offensive parts of Mein Kampf missing. So for example, uh, she points out that Hitler's plans to invade England were not included in the English translation of Mein Kampf. So she thought that um, this was a disaster because it meant that no one in Britain knew what Hitler's plans really were. And this included the cabinet, uh, because she said, if you're writing in German, as, as far as the political class in the 1930s was concerned, you may as, well, may as well have been writing a secret code and that hardly any British politician would have been able to understand German and they, and they wouldn't have taken the trouble to read it. So she produced a digest of it. And it's fascinating to me because it didn't um, completely coincide with, with what I thought. 
And what Lorimer has picked out is, is, is that there are three central planks to Mein Kampf. Uh, one is, of course, is uh, the main topic for us is the type of crude nationalism, which includes essentially the othering of Jews, but not only of the Jews. The second um, was attacks on the social democrats and also social democracy, of course. Um, but the third was uh, the defense of workers' rights. And this was a, something slightly staggering to me to see the defense of workers' rights, because of course you assume fascism is a right-wing view, right-wing is pro-business, not pro-worker. Um, but then of course, as everyone says, what was the name of the Nazi party, the National Socialists? Um, if you're on the left in the UK and you see the name National Socialists, you, you just say, well, that was just a name. It doesn't mean anything. But then when you look at the origins of fascism, you see that um, uh, Mussolini began as a socialist. Um, he broke with the socialists over nationalism, that uh, in Italy, the socialists opposed the First World War. Mussolini was in favor. And so he and the pro-war socialists split off to form their own party, which was very progressive to begin with. So it included votes for women, the reduction of the working day to eight hours, progressive income tax. So the original fascist program was a national, a nationalist socialist program. And if you look at Hitler's early manifestos, so very similar things about uh, expropriation of war profits, uh, regulation of the working day. Many of the demands from the early Nazis could have been in a communist manifesto as well, or at least a socialist manifesto. And I, looking in the UK, I looked at um, the writings of Oswald Mosley, who luckily never had the power or influence that Hitler or Mussolini did. But again, Mosley was someone who had broken from the socialists, partly on the grounds that they weren't thoroughgoing enough. So Mosley, the British fascist, broke with the socialists because the socialists had become too pro-business and not sufficiently supportive of the workers' rights. So I found this fascinating that you begin with a, a, an appeal to the workers' rights, to workers' rights, an appeal to the workers. But of course, that makes a lot of sense because if you want to build a program, if you want to build a broad-based movement, you have to get the workers on board one way or another. You have to say something that will attract the workers. Um, what Robert Paxton is very good at pointing out is that particularly Hitler um, had different messages for different groups. So to the workers, he was pro-workers, to business, he was pro-business, and he managed somehow to keep this um, keep all these different constituencies going, all thinking that he was on their side. And of course, um, none of the fascists really did uh, carry out their promises to the workers, uh, but they needed the workers' support to get where they were. So, um, the, so Lorimer was writing in 1939, and just by way of aside, uh, some years ago, I was reading the work by T.S. Eliot that was also written in 1939. And Eliot uh, was giving a public lecture at Cambridge, and he pointed out that in the world in which he was living, there were three major world ideologies. There was Soviet communism, there was a fascism of Italy and Germany, and the liberal democracy, which he identified with America, uh, the UK, and France. And he said, we have these three world ideologies. And his view was that in the medium term, only one could prevail. You couldn't have a world with these three different ideologies in. But writing in 1939, he said, he said we have no idea which is going to be the victor of these three. We, we, going to, we have no idea which will prevail. I mean, looking back, of course, people have been very triumphant about liberal democracy. And, you know, one point for Guillermo talking about the end of history as if you know, ideology is over and then about the end of ideology. But um, from Eliot's point, it's a matter of complete contingency about who's going to win this ideological battle, which of course was a military battle um, in, in many cases. 
And so you know, some will say, well, perhaps we're in a position now where we have two ideologies, liberal democracy and authoritarianism. Communism doesn't seem to be, uh, but maybe you know, chi China has um, some claim to be an alternative to authoritarianism, liberal democracy as well. So the, the uh, thought here is that we're very used to seeing stories of history moving forward. If you're at all influenced by Marxist tradition, we're on a road to progress or Whiggish, uh, you know, liberalism will triumph. But I, I think what I learned from Elias and what I learned now is that there's no necessity to any of this and that what will happen depends on what we do rather than which is the best idea or which seems to be the most appealing idea. So anyway, I digress a little bit. Go, going back to Lorimer, I, I said that she had three, she identified three main planks for, the, for Hitler and the Nazis. The first was workers' rights, which I briefly mentioned. Second, crude nationalism. And anti-Semitism was part of that for Hitler, although um, not for Mussolini, at least not at first. And Mussolini actually found it harder to find the group to other. Um, apparently, the Southern Slavs were for his group. Um, Mosley also was anti-Semitic and um, treated Jews as foreigners. Um, but the language is always one of, you know, of, as Carl Schmidt has it, of friends and enemies. Who are the friends? Who are the enemies? Um, and using the language of traitors and parasites, things you're much used to. Uh, Mosley talks about enemies of the people. Uh, there's constant themes of dehumanization. Uh, the Jews are lice or rats or dogs or pigs even, um, and attempt to treat one group as less than human in some important way. So, um, that it, none of this is news to you, but um, I'm sorry, it's just beginning. I, although I'm in Jer sunny Jersey, it's just beginning to rain, so I'm taking my computer inside. Excuse me just for a second while I carry on talking. Okay, so I hope this is still going to work. It all seems very much darker to me now, but uh, okay. Um, so, I, I'm, so I'm sitting in the Sitting in the dark here. Okay, this, this might be a little bit better. Um, but I think you can still hear me, Charles. Is that okay? So I can't hear you, but anyway, I, I think that's a Just good sign. Unmute yourself, Charles. Yeah, sorry. We hear, we see you pretty well, and we can hear you perfectly. Okay, that's great. So I'll, I'll carry on like this. So, um, so the. Um, when Paxson talks about the uh, rise of the Nazi parties, uh, you know, there's so many familiar aspects here. Uh, violence, uh, extrajudicial violence becomes part of it. Um, almost paramilitary dress. So we know about the black shirts in, uh, well, we, we had black shirts in Germany, the brown shirts we had in England, but, but other countries had the orange shirts, the blue shirts, even the white uniforms of the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan are part of this type of uh, militarization. And, the, and just a group of men wearing colored shirts already gives you the threat of violence, even if there's no actual violence there. So we, ha we have the crude nationalism links violence and nationalism and um, attacks are what others would regard as civilized value values uh, using imagery of, of swarms and floods of immigrants so that crude nationalism and othering is always part of the far right what interests me that i know this is uh, as some of called anti-semitism but it's uh, another aspect that interests me more uh, which is about protections and democracy so uh, Lorimer talks about attacks on the social democrats but also on social democracy and one thing that seems to happen with far right groups, and we're seeing it in the world now, is that they use the mechanisms of democracy to obtain power. But once they're there, they start to dismantle 
democracy or dismantle democratic protections in order to keep hold of power. So Oswald Mosley is absolutely naked about this, that his goal among the fascists is to win a democratic majority and then pretty much stitch up the system so that he can't ever be voted out again. Um, and so th this means undermining things like the division of power, the separation of powers, the independent upper house, independent local government, um, muting the press, muting the universities, making people frightened to speak out, to change electoral processes, disenfran disenfranchising immigrants and foreigners, making sure that only the true born. So this interests me on a practical level, but it also interests me on a philosophical level because it links to two very important arguments about democracy that uh, was part of our philosophical discussion. And the first one is really a question about it. What do we mean by democracy? And here we, if you ask people now what a democracy is, probably most people will talk about majority rule, that the democracy is about a democratic vote with the, demo with the democratic majority uh, having power. And that seems right that, um, sorry, Joel started screen sharing on my screen. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Um, okay. So the, yeah, so the, the first idea is what is democracy and the idea of the will of the majority. But um, John Stuart Mill and de Tocqueville before him warned that majority, it, although we thought democracy was a protection against tyranny, it contains within it a different type of tyranny, a different possibility of tyranny, which is the tyranny of the majority. And there's always been a tension in democracy between the will of the majority and the protection of the minority. And we protect the minority through rights and liberties and say there are limits to democracy. But what um, authoritarian leaders tend to do is to think that once they're in power, they have been empowered by the will of the majority. They speak for the people. They speak on behalf of the will of the majority. And anyone who tries to stand in their way to protect minority rights is an enemy of the will of the people, an enemy of the people. So those who stand up for minority rights are enemies of the people in one way. They're elitists. They're trying to undermine uh, the popular support for the leader. And so we, we have this way in which protections get undermined one by one by an authoritarian uh, government who only sees majority rule and the will of the people and not the protection of minorities as the other half of democracy. But then we, we get to the second problem in, in thinking about democracy. And I was really astonished to see this. This is in Hitler's address to the Dusseldorf industrialists. And I, so I don't know whether Hitler read Plato or Hitler reinvented Plato's argument. But um, Plato has a very strong argument against democracy, which is, uh, he runs it by analogy. He, he says, uh, the one version of Plato's arguments in the Republic is that you know, if you were ill and you wanted advice about your health, you would go to a doctor, you would go to an expert. The last thing you would do would be to go to the marketplace and ask for a show of hands on what you should do. You should, in, instead of um, asking the people, you ask the expert. And so where there is a skill that needs exercising, we need to ask the expert, not the people. And Plato says, isn't the health of the state just as important as the health of any individual? And so what isn't it equally irrational to ask for the um, will of the people or the vote of the people when we're talking about political decision making and shouldn't we have the rule of the expert and Hitler makes almost the identical argument that when he's talking to the Dusseldorf industrialists he says you know, who knows about your business is it you or your workers and of course the industrialists say well it's us we're the experts and Hitler says so is why is the state any different shouldn't we have the expert rulers ruling the state on behalf of the people. And so Hitler does this sort of double move. First of all, he 
says that democracy should be, well, he implies democracy should be about the will of the people, not minority rights. And then he says, and he's in a better position to judge the will of the people than the people themselves, because the people are not experts in their own will. Or, and so we don't need democracy anymore. We need the rule of the strong. So then um, we get opposition to the press, the universities, the trade unions. Um, we get states controlled religion even. We get civil society disappearing that you remember in totalitarian states, uh, you can't even have a local history society because that has to be taken over and approved by the state just in case it happens to be a place for polit political opposition. So um, we, we, we saw in uh, the rise of fascism, this incredible centralizing trend to try to put all power in the center, uh, disperse power, our ways in which the will of the people will be frustrated. And so this is what I'm interested in looking at now. It, when I'm looking at parallels between the 1930s and the 2020s, what are we seeing? Are we seeing attacks on the independence of the judiciary? Yes, we are. Are we seeing attacks on the press? Yes, we are. Are we seeing attacks on local government? In some places we are and others not yet, but that would be something to be looking out for. Are we seeing limitations on civil society activity? Well, we're not, but that again would be a place to look for. So my argument is not that we're on the verge of fascism. I don't think we are on the verge of fascism, uh, but I'm also reminded of something that I thought was a quote from Stefan Zweig, but I've never been able to find it. So. Maybe it was a commentary. As Stefan Zweig is said to have said, um, everything was normal until it wasn't. And that's his way of pointing out how quickly things can change. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to understand democracy better. We need to understand protection of minority rights. We need to understand constitutional rights as well. We need to understand that human rights are always going to be unpopular. Uh, because the whole point of having human rights is to protect the unpopular and we need to understand what should be kept out of day-to-day -day politics in some way rise above it we have to go beyond thinking about friend and enemy in the way that carl schmidt argued for so i've lost track of time i think i'm around about half an hour here so maybe this would be just a convenient place to stop but that's okay charles yeah thank you very much joe so um, what I would like to do, so people are applauding. So Joe, thank you very much for, for your wise words and analysis. So what I would like to do is try to get Joel back in to do his presentation kind of on the history of anti-Semitism and then have a Q&A with everybody, with both Joe, Joel and Joe. If that can work technically, it would be great. And if not, we can start a, a Q&A with Joe. So Joel, are you with us? Yes. Okay. Do you want to give it you a listen shot? Listen to me. We I uh, hear you well now. How is the? I'll change my computer. I've got another computer. Maybe this one is better. I don't know. Uh, How is it? Not great, but let's try. Uh, okay, let's try it. So, so what I camera, which might help. okay, and 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 you've got a presentation or not? No, we don't. Uh, see yes, let me share. Okay, I will share it. Joel, we hear you better without the camera going. Right. So go on, go on. So Joel, can you do the history of anti-Semitism in 20 minutes? <laughs> yes, I will try, of course. Okay. It's going to be, of course, I'm gone. So what I try to explain is the difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism. It seems to be very important to understand today radical anti-Zionism, because today we are facing radical anti-Zionism. And this is a new version of what I call traditional anti-Semitism. And uh, that's why I think it's important to stress the difference between anti-Judaism and, and anti-Semitism. Because anti-Judaism condemns Judaism for what it is, a rival 
and besides the matrix. And as I said, the Jews are blamed for what they are, people opposing the sanctity of Christ or of Muhammad. And of course, they are uh, blamed for what they are, really. And the difference with anti-Semitism is the fact that with anti-Semitism, Jews are not blamed for what they are or for what they believe. They are blamed for what they don't do. It means, for instance, killing children, if you think uh, terrible diseases like the plague, etc. Or, as I said, you know, uh, willing to conquer the world or to try to more or less attend to the non-Jewish people. So go on, if you don't mind. And uh, go on, go on. Ira? Go Go on, I'm so sorry. As I said, the origin of the origin, go on. Okay. Okay, go on. It's not so easy. I will try to do it within 20 minutes. And so, as I said, it's the logical opposition to the father who will inspire the relationship between Judaism two opposing religions. So, um, and go on. Okay. Okay. Ira? Ira? You're listening to me? Now. And so despite the hatred, yes, okay. So what is important is to stress that the Jews are, will constitute during the Middle Age the only minority tolerated within Christian and Muslim state. And of course, this is logic that they will gradually become, as I said, the usual suspect and ideal scapegoat. So, and you can find it as the Jews as a necessary evil, an error in the service of truth. And then of course, interested in St. Augustine, who ruled that the Jews should not be killed, but condemned to dispersion and mutation as a sign of the church victory over the synagogue. And this explains also this so-called malediction, the fact that the Vatican was the latest state to recognize the state of, of Israel, because by recognizing the state of Israel, in fact, is to say that St. Augustine's uh, malediction was is any more caduc. So it is a kind of condemnation to eternal servitude that will be maintained for centuries. And what is important to stress, considering anti-Judaism, annihilation is not advocated by the father of the church or even desire. The Jews actually serve the purpose of the, ch of the church, of Christianity. It shows that if you don't recognize the true religion, you will be in a situation of second of third kind of subject. Okay, go on. Yeah, go on. Yeah, Ira. And this is an example of what, what the Jews are. When you can see, this is a very famous painting of the Flemish painter. And you can see that the Jews, that, no, 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 <laughs> that the Jews, because they, they, don't, they don't listen, they don't want to recognize that the Christ came to save the, the world, humanity, that you can see how the Jews are portrayed. People stubborn, who doesn't want to know, who doesn't want to listen to the truth. And they are. That's why, uh, and this is what you can say anti-Judaism is. Okay, go on. Yes, of course it doesn't, it was not violent. Stop, it was not violent, no. <laughs> the priest, the, 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 before, 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 yes. It doesn't mean that the relation was not pleasant. Of course it was kind of violent. And if you read St. John Chrysostom, you will see that the Jews, even if you can say the Judaism is, is blamed for what it is, of course, there is the prodrome. The origin of what I call anti-Semitism is the fact that the father of the church will accuse the Jews of having killed, uh, slain the Christ, it means. And you, and, and you can say that this, the myth of Judah, will explain and will finally provoke the mutation from anti-Judaism to anti-Semitism. As I said, 
anti-Judaism despite Judaism for what it is, anti-Semitism despite the Jews for what they are not. And they didn't kill the Christ, but of course this myth, what I call the first fake news, will finally provoke the first killing of the Jews starting in the 11th century with the Crusades. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you can see. Oh, okay. And so as a sin of the Christ, precisely, and the day size, as I say, and the myth of Judah announces anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism being, I would say, um, um, described and, uh, as being the Jews being responsible, defined being responsible of the woes of the world, being responsible of the what went through. And of course, as you know, the Romans were responsible of Jesus' death, certainly not the Jews, but the genius of the father of the church will be to accuse the Jews and not the Romans for having killed the Christ. And this is very visible within the, I would say, the iconography of Judah. Go on. Go on. This is the of Christ. And of course, all the people around Jesus, of course, are Jew. But as as I said, the genius, the, the father of the church, will be to designate one of them, Judah, as the responsible of the killing of the Christ. And you will see in iconography that more and more Jesus will resemble more and more as a so-called Aryan, and more and more Judah will look like a traditional Jew, like a Stormer Jew. And of course, everyone was Jewish. And it's not by and it's and, and and the the wonderful thing is the fact that the traitor the one who was accused of and what means judah it means the jews like the jews is responsible with the sahedrin of the of the the killing the day side absurd because all of them were jews but if you wanted to convert the romans you couldn't of course accuse the roman of being responsible of this Go on, then you will see how Judah will be presented more and more as a Semite, more and, and you will see that his face look more and more uh, terrible and like I would say even a Nordic man, which is absurd because Jesus was as Jew as Judah used to be and spear and whatsoever. And, and, and go on. And this is precisely, of course. Uh, the origin of what I call anti-Semitic caricatures. You can see it in already in the Middle Age. You can see that here in a Middle Age manuscript, it's the Jews who are responsible of the death of Jesus, not the Romans, because they wear the very famous Jewish hats. Go on. Okay. Okay. Ira? Yeah? Okay. Hey, Gaira, go on. Next one. And look this one. Again, you see Jesus, and then you will see it's already a 13th century in the British Museum, and you can see already, you know, how the Jews are portrayed. And then it's really the 13th century, between the 12th and the 13th century, that anti-Semitism and such will arrive, will be invented in sense, of course, deriving from anti-Judaism, and as I said, what is anti-Semitism? The fact that the Jews are responsible of the, of the misfortune of the world. As today, you can see that Israel is you know, considered by more and more people as responsible of the disaster that went wrong of today, uh, international relations, for instance. And what is anti-Semitism? The Jews, they do or really are, but what they don't do and are not they're not evil creature with murderous practice. They don't poison wells, they don't children, they don't sting disease like plague, but they will be accused of this because the Jews become those responsible for the misfortune of it's the world. And this is... What? Uh, if you could take uh, five to 10 more minutes and then we'll- Yes, have it's okay, no problem. Okay. Thanks. I will, okay, go on. 
Okay, go on. And so the hatred of the Jew born in the 12th century wakes up the priest, and then you will see the first killing of the Jews. You couldn't find pogroms, of course, it's a, it's a Russian term, before the Crusades. Uh, you couldn't find. It will be the beginning of, the, I would say, uh, the terrible fate of the Jews. Go on. And of course, the terrible accusation central in radical Islamism. The fact that the Jews are killing Palestinian children derive from this period. Because in this period, the Jews will be accused of killing Christian children. As today, Israeli people are accused of killing on purpose Palestinian children, etc. And of course, you know that during the Black Death, epidemics will devastate Europe and the Jews will be, of course, accused of it and they will be taken as scapegoat. Okay? Go on. Okay? Okay? And this is images during the Middle Age. And you can see the Jews being taken as responsible of the plague, as today, you know, COVID-19 also provoked a, a new wave of anti-Semitism in France, in Britain, whatsoever. In France, for instance, it was the Minister of Health who was accused of of having invented. Go on, go on. Okay, Ira. Yep. Go on. Slides. Ira. Go on. Another example of Jews being killed, etc. Go on, go on, go on. This is creation of the host, those myths are invented in the 12th century, not before. And blood libel is an invention of the late Middle Age. And the myth of the Jewish infanticides, 1140 for England, and this is an example, and it shows the fact that the matrix of today antisemitism and today radical anti-Zionism dates back in the Middle Age, not in the 19th century, even if the word Antisemitism was coined in this period. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go on. Okay. okay. More. And those images remind us also the fact that Jesus are connected to the devil. And this is, you know, the satanic Jews dates back from the Middle Age. And this is really the core. And this is an image who showed Judah. Uh, and Judah is no more represented as a normal person. This is a 15th century, you know, painting. And it looks like a Nazi painting. The characters of, I would say, 19th century anti-Semitic cartoons or 20th century Sturmer cartoons. You know, the Jews is linked to the devil. He sell his soul to the devil. And this is really, you can understand that anti-Semitism is a fabrication of late Middle Age. So the image of the Zionists, of the Jews, what in today parts of the world. Okay, five minutes, go on. Okay, yep. The religious is just, you know, the continuation of the idea that the Jews are the ideal scapegoat by which to explain the world's misfortune, like Israel explained the world's misfortune. Go on, and I will stop. Okay, go on. <coughs> ah. Yes, this is an example. This, this is Dreyfus, the responsible, you know, during Great Affairs. On. The Jews connected to Bolshevism. Go on. And I would like to go on. Judeo Bolshevism. Judaism modernity evil. Of course, the Jews trying to control the world, uh, being, you know, worse than animals, not human beings, actually. Go on. The principle of evil. And I would like to. And this is, you know, cover of the 
protocol of the wise of Zions. Okay. Go. Ira. Okay. And of course, the Jews will explain the defeat of Germany and Austria against the Allies. In 19, the Jews, you know, because they're betrayed, they are responsible of the defeat. And of course, it's totally absurd, knowing the fact that the German Jews were as fanatic, as patriotic as the rest of the society. Okay, let's go on, and I will start on today. Antisemitism, racism, go on. Go on, go on, go on. Yeah. Okay, go on. And again, images occur. Okay, this is connected to Nazi Germany and radical anti-Zionism. I'll stop here. It's the return of the scapegoat. It's the old idea starting back. And this is interesting. It's actually, it's an American cartoonist or I don't know, graphist called David Dees. And according to David Dees, for instance, of course, it's no more the Jews, but the Zionists, which are responsible of, well, today misfortunes. And for instance, he will accuse the Zionists being responsible of immigration, whether in the States or in Western Europe. Those who bring the Arabs and the black people in Western Europe are the Zionists. The Zionist Jews are gen as legal immigration, we'll see how powerful this idea is, of course. Go on. EU multiculturalism is white genocide. Okay. Okay. Ira, go on. Next one. Hello. And look, for instance, Zionists unleash total weapon, and even, you know, uh, Macron being responsible you know, of today immigration. And this is the former Minister of Health in France being responsible of the coronavirus diseases. Like, exactly like in the Middle Age, today Jews are responsible of the misfortune of the world, of France, etc. Okay? Okay, okay. And voila, the Jews are behind the pandemics, etc. And whatsoever, you know, the Rothschild being responsible of coronavirus. And this is, of course, a so-called Iraqi political scientist who will tell this. And more or less, we can stop here, maybe next one. And then you can understand that radical anti-Semitism is exactly as the same function than anti-Semitism. It served the purpose of explaining what went wrong. And for instance, I will stop here. There was a debate on Egyptian TV and one, the Sheikh claims that there is a Jewish plot to decrease Egypt population. And the political scientists said, no, the plot is to increase it. So it means whatever it is, the Jews are responsible of the misfortune of the world. And this idea, as I said, dates back from the Middle Age, and it helped us to understand the strength of antisemitism, on, I would say, in a, in, in a marketing point of view. It served the purpose of everyone and to explain a very complex world, the Jews are responsible. So we can more or less stop here. Okay, Joel, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry we had uh, technical issues, but it's a very important uh, foundational presentation. So thank you, Joel. Um, so now we have, we have about 20 minutes. Did you hear me? Yeah. Did, did you hear me? Yes? We heard you pretty well. It was okay? It was okay. okay. You can hear me? Okay, yes. Okay, so yeah, the so people are grateful. So thank you, Joel. Sorry for the technical issues. So um, I would like. So we have twenty minutes. For, I'm sorry. We have okay. We have twenty minutes for Q and A. Um, so I think I'll start off with a question for for Joe, Joe Wolf. So how do you, given sort of the history of of anti-Semitism in Western civilization? And, you know, going back to, to the beginning of Christianity and through the ages, as Joel was trying to present, how, how do you see the role of anti-Semitism with the rise of extreme nationalism and fascism and Nazism? What was the role of anti-Semitism in this sort of... Uh, yeah. To get out of the family constraints. They had to go out with his buddies to, to let's say, drink and to, to be away from his wife and his 
children, etc. And what I also read about German girls, uh, do you know why they joined the Nazi, uh, the Hitler Youth, German girls? To get away from family control. Yeah, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Or the, 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 the boys, you know, join, not because they were, let's say, little boys. What do they know about politics, you know? They join for all sorts of different reasons. And the last thing that I wanted to say, which is what's really, really, uh, let's say, important is for Germans, I think, is the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community. That is really, like, until today, is, is a real big thing for the Germans. You have to feel as a common community. Okay? Okay, enough. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. So, Bernard and then Elia. Bernard, please feel free. I think you're muted. If you could unmute and pose your question. There you okay. Go. Uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, uh, regarding the uh, crimes of infantile uh, that he mentioned, that my question is to Professor Kotek. Uh, historically, uh, dispelling meat, uh, it's often easier when one can identify the original contextual uh, circumstances in which that meat was extrapolated. Of course, there are some meats that are outright you know, fabrications. And uh, I'm thinking that uh, what are these original contextual uh, circumstances from which some of these meats were you know, uh, extrapolated from and then probably blown out of proportion or misinterpreted? Uh, and I'm particularly curious about the one about uh, the killing of children. Now, how did this come about? Uh, what exactly was misconstrued? Because in uh, Africa here, uh, we find out uh, some issues are misunderstood, uh, misrepresented, or are blown out of context because of some uh, uh, circumstances which were misinterpreted or misconstrued. So uh, I don't know if Professor Kotek would uh, identify, would uh, uh, deal with that particular issue uh, in reference to uh, the killing of children. What exactly? Uh, did this, how did this originate and did it come about? Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hello, can I speak or I have to wait? No, no, please go ahead, Joe. Kotek. So what's it? what I want to stress also, going on, on the first question is the fact that nowadays people who are designated as responsible, for instance, of Govic Disneuf, you will find Rothschild and you will find George Soros. And this, this also explains us, the, I would say, the utility, the usefulness of antisemitism, of being able to have those people, you know, for considering the, uh, the, fact, the, the fact that John Germans joined the SA or the SS because they wanted to leave, maybe, but which seems to be quite fascinating is the fact how easily those people finally came uh, quite easily to kill children and, and, and babies in the front, exactly. You know, when you, when you read, uh, for instance, Christopher Browning books about the fact that even the German soldiers could refuse to kill children and, and women, that only 3% did finally refuse. It, you know, it helped us to understand that maybe there is a special path of Germans of Germany, etc. Because finally, in the 19th century, Austria and Germany, they have, of course, they have a special relation to the nation. I, I can understand the world Gemeinschaft, etc. As a definition of the of the nation, which was Völkisch, it means uh, the importance of the fact that they don't have a citizen definition of. The, and even if the Jews, they were in Germany for more than I don't know seven centuries they were still considered as foreign people and maybe there is i think you have also to to study the cultural roots of uh, germany if you have to understand nazism because you know when you see the difference between the italians fascists and the german fascists you will see that italian fascists they, they resent to kill children jewish children they, they resent it and it was unfortunately not the case of i would say the German soldiers, 
even within the Wehrmacht, etc. If you, if you, there are known several studies about the crimes of the Wehrmacht, etc. Considering the, the 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 fact that the Jews were, you know, accusing of, you know, killing children, it explains us what anti-Semitism is. Anti-Semitism is the invention of reality, because if you understand what the the purpose of Abraham, you know, uh, sacrifice, etc., Isaac sacrifice, you understand that Judaism forbid sacrifices when it was you know, very common within, I would say, the Greek civilization. If you remember Agamemnon and his daughter that he sacrificed to be able to fight against the Trojans. Within the Jews, it's a force you to do something. There is a imperative category which forbid you, of course, especially to kill children. So what is anti-Semitism? It's totally irrational. It's the contrary of truth. It's the projection of what you want to do to the Jews to kill their children and you accuse, you accuse them that they want to kill your children, etc. And there is uh, more or less in the, in the antiquities, the Jews of Alexandria were already accused of, you know, sacrificing uh, young know, uh, pagans, all so forth. It's very difficult to understand how suddenly it came through 1144, but in a sense, also, it's another way of explaining, I would say, the deicides. Because what the Jews are supposed to do to those young martyrs is exactly what they were supposed to have done to Jesus. In the iconology, in the, in the way how they represent the sacrifice of, of those young children, they are always portrayed as Jesus on the cross. So it's, I would say, a repetition of the old, old accusation of deicides, etc. So again, if you want to understand anti-Semitism today and of yesterday, you have to study anthropology, you have to be interested in, I would say, in the cultural roots of Islam and the cultural roots, I would say, of Christianity. It's, you, you know that in Christianity, the Jews are accused of having killed Christ, but in the Muslim tradition, the Jews also are accused of having poisoned the prophet Muhammad, etc., and which is thought to be absurd. Understand that the Jews are always portrayed as those responsible of the what went wrong. Of course, if you want to destroy Judaism because you want to replace it, you have to, more or less to describe it as the most evil face, the most evil parts of humanity. And of course, people who kill children cannot be saved. And this, I would say, is the purpose of, right. of course, uh, this terrible myth of ritual murder. There is nothing worse than... Okay, and Joel, uh, thank you very much, Joel, for, for your response. And now I'd like to ask Alia Awad to ask a question. You're still muted. There you ah, go. Now, now I can talk. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question to Christoph Gassenschmidt to your comment because I'm well, actually uh, Alia. Could you please? Uh, I would like to, um, if we can address our questions to the speakers, and we'll have time later to discuss. Can you integrate your comment to a question to the speakers, please? Is that no? You, you want to ask a question to the speakers? No, okay. Sorry to interrupt you. It's just we don't have too much time with uh, Joe and Joel. So Carol, you're welcome to ask your question. You have to unmute yourself. You're still muted. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? I hear you, yeah. Yeah, uh, and maybe the question is for, for both speakers. Um, there is a claim by authors like, for example, Richard Levinson, a German economist who in 1925 said that in a book that um, the, the race of um, the, new, the new face of anti-Semitism, which was the, the Jews as controlling the world finance, was uh, actually came from dialectic materialism and from, from Marxism. I would like to know if you, if you would 
make any comments on that. It's like uh, a new type of antisemitism that was raising at that time in, in Germany. Well, uh, it was obvious, uh, Hitler was uh, already around. And uh, if you see that there is, uh, there is something about that claim that it would be uh, a type uh, related more to uh, dialectic materialism than of the old kind of antisemitism. Thank you, Carol. So, Joe Wolf, you want to take the question, please? Yeah. Uh, so, I can, so I can comment a little bit of, of, about that. But, do, you, uh, do, you, do you hear me? But, okay. But, but Joel, you go ahead. Uh, uh, Joel, let, let Joe Wolf huh? answer the question, and then you can answer <laughs> after. <laughs> okay, very, very quickly. Very, oh. very quickly. Of course, because of Nazism, we are more focused on extreme right antisemitism, nationalist antisemitism. But it's true that there is also another kind of antisemitism in the 19th century. It was the, I would say, ultra left, extreme left antisemitism, etc. And it's true that if you will read young Marx uh, about the Jewish question, of course, he will make a kind of homology between Judaism and capitalism. He says, you know, the, the bank is wh wh where the Jews are worshipping, etc. Their God is Baal, and, and etc. And there is a tradition of, I would say, evolutionary social, and, and we forgot it. And of course, the plain, it means how today radical anti Zionism will also. Okay, I think, can, I think we lost Joel. So, Joe Wolf, uh, could you please yeah. respond? Or? So I, I was, was going to mention the same text. So if, uh, very early writing, 1843, on the Jewish question, um, Marx talks about the dirty, dirty Jewish uh, nature of commerce. So, so Marx, in that early essay, so, so written in his 20s, uh, certainly does have some anti-Semitic content. And when I was teaching this, I deliberately didn't teach, it's in the second half of the on the Jewish question essay. And I deliberately only taught the first half because I didn't know what to do with those comments from Marx. Um, and you know, he, he, he does have that trope of identifying banking really with, uh, with, with well, and, and middlemen trade. Uh, so one thing that's quite interesting in Hannah Arendt is she po points out that uh, the Jewish involvement in capitalism was almost never major industrial capitalism. It was always banking and finance and trading. Um, so so it, it wasn't you know, Jewish factory owners, particularly it was Jewish bankers and, Jewish, and small Jewish traders. And I think Marx does have that aspect in him, but I don't see it as intrinsic to dialectical materialism. Um, I, but it, it's certainly true that there is a trope on the left to identify the worst aspects of international capitalism with, with Judaism. And you know, the trope of the Rothschilds and Soros, as uh, Joel mentioned, is repeated there. I mean, I, you know, my feeling is Marx was just doing what other people were doing rather than doing something new in those writings. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for one more question, if people could uh, see Michael Ben. So you know what, well, let's collect two questions. So Michael, we'll try, this is like technologically tricky, but Michael Ben and then Gil Khan. If you can ask two succinct questions and then we'll let the speakers respond. Uh, ben, uh, Michael, you're uh, muted still. There you go. No, you're muted again. Michael, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good okay. now. Um, there seems to be an interesting phenomenon in the United States where our far right politics are concerned. You know, on one hand, there's obviously a great deal of anti Semitism, um, you know, as evidenced by the march in Charlottesville last year where people are screaming, where, you know, white nationalists, white supremacists are screaming, um, you know, Jews will not replace us. But then there seems to be a great deal of support for the state of Israel. Um, you know, our president, Trump, a racist with fascist tendencies, has a great relationship or seem a seemingly good relationship with Netanyahu. And there's a lot of support from, uh, from the right, specifically the Republican Party, 
for the state of Israel. Um, and I'm wondering maybe if one of you could explain that phenomenon or, or help it make sense. Okay, thank you, Michael. And a quick question from Gil, and then we'll let the speakers respond. Gil, I think you're good. No, you're still muted. Okay, so Gil, you're not on muting. So, uh, no, Gil, we can't hear you. So, would Joel, would you like to respond to Michael's question? But Joel, you're muted. There you go. Joel, can you hear us? No, Joel's muted. Joel Wolf, would you like to respond to Michael's question? Okay, you, uh, you okay. What I will, what I want, I think, I think the, the, the person was right. Now we have to make also a new differentiation between, I would say, extreme right and right extreme and the populist. And, 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 and it's true that populists of today, because of uh, the fear of Islam, etc., are more or less uh, forgetting about their anti-Semitism, etc., and you can see it almost everywhere in Europe. But still, the neo-Nazis and, and and I will say the core of neo-fascism very strangely are still considering the Jews as their personal enemies, etc. And the example was this David Dees, you know, this very strange American, etc., and all those cartoonists, etc., who are still, you know. Uh, they are leaving the Jews and, for instance, as I say, Shoros is controlling the world and trying to, to destroy uh, our uh, today European wide civilization. It's a shift. I agree. Okay, thank you, Joel. And so, Joel Wolf, would you like to respond to Michael's question? I, and then, I, so I, I don't have any more to add to that. So perhaps you can take the next okay. question. Yeah. So, so Gil, go okay, ahead. Okay, to piggyback on. Uh, the comments from Michael and uh, take it another step further. And then a, a quick question also for Joel. It seems to me, and I've written about and others a lot, the, the anti-democratic tendencies that are present in the United States, uh, and in some respects, virtually uh, co coming close to fascistic attitudes that have been expressed, uh, suggest that uh, there are really uh, uh, people prepared to deny and to tolerate uh, very serious anti-democratic uh, directions for this country uh, from the top down. And I think that presents a, an, an enormous challenge, or could certainly, uh, uh, depending on what happens uh, in November. And the other thing for Joel is that the, the question comes to my mind about the distinction between uh, uh, Judaism's religious component and its national component, and the point at which the, the denial or the rejection or the un unwillingness to accept Judaism as a faith on the one hand, and to address the question of Jude Jewish national identity and attachment uh, to, to the Holy Land. And the two, uh, in various points in history, come closer and separate as to two distinct issues. And uh, that's part of the dilemma of trying to address uh, the, the problem both today and historically. Thank you, Gil. Would Joe or Joel, Joe, would you like to respond first to that? So I think no, it was no, a question no, no, no. for Joel. Okay. It was a question for Joel, I thought. Oh. Uh, so the first one, you, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm I'm not an expert on the United States. I, I'm I'm an observer. I, I think I'll uh, I, I let others um, tell me about it rather than pretend a wisdom in an area that I. I'm not familiar with, so, uh, so I think I think I'll pass on on that rather than pretend the answer. And Joel Kotek, you want to respond, or you're good? Yeah, but I have to listen very well. It, it, my that's the problem, unfortunately. You know, I didn't okay. listen. Okay. I'm sorry. No problem. No problem. Uh, a, okay. So I think I have a question. Hang on. I think what we're going to do we're, that we're we're low on time. So I, I would like to make a, a quick comment, and then we'll take our break. And I'm sorry for the uh, technical issues. Hopefully, it'll become more smooth. I would say to to Michael and to our American friends, I think the gaze of the United States I find fascinating. 
um, sort of being t teaching. I've taught in Israel, Europe, and North America, South Africa, India. And um, I think for my American colleagues, I think we have to, I think there's domestic politics. And I think we have to be mindful not to take that gaze and place it on the world. And I, I, I remember Malcolm X going on the Hajj and uh, being sort of blown away that people perceived each other much differently in the Middle East than they do in the United States. So I think we have to be careful not to take these domestic politics and place that gaze on the entire world. Um, you know, so just a thought. And um, so on that note, I wanted to thank uh, Joel Kotek and Joe Wolf very much for being with us. I really thank appreciate you. it. And um, you're very thank welcome. Thank you very much. Stick around. Thank you, Joel. Enjoy Italy. And, and Joe, enjoy your break too. And thank you for taking the time out to Thanks. join us. Thanks. <laughs> A pleasure. So thank you. Thank you for hosting me, Charles and Ira. And thank you everyone for the comments and also the comments in the, in the chat, which uh, I've been looking through as well and answering one or two when I can. So thanks so much. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much too. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, so everybody, we're gonna, we have a time for a 30 minute break so you can um, get some food, coffee, take a rest. And we're gonna come back sharp on top of the hour, which will be uh, 4 p.m. in the UK and 11 a.m. on the East Coast of the United States. And we will have